Um, so uh, I'm just going to uh, give a little bit of um, s s some slightly randomly organized thoughts on, uh, on the Retival in, in terms of just some studies I've done and, and what I've learned uh, uh, using it. Um, uh, before I forget, I'll just acknowledge uh, a whole lot of other people who've been helping in different ways with these studies, collaborators and research students, uh, and some funding organizations uh, that have kindly funded this work. Uh, so I'll talk mainly about some studies, uh, and it'll be quite brief, in, in the Twins UK cohort. Um, we've looked at heritability of retinal responses. Uh, we've actually looked at the effect of electrode position as well. Um, uh, we tried to establish a, a normative range for some of the photopic tests. We've looked at right-left, so from what Rad was uh, relevant to what he was asking before, we, we have found a right-left di difference that's probably related probably to the order of testing uh, and an association with age. And, and some preliminary studies in, in some patient co cohorts, patients with birdshot uveitis, uh, autism spectrum disorder, so another... Um, uh, neuropsychiatric uh, condition. Um, and ABCA4 retinopathy, we've looked at a little bit to because the, the, the full field cone ERG can provide some prognostic information, but for, for time purposes and because it's very, very, it's a pilot study so far, I won't talk about that. So the Twins UK co cohort is, a, is um, one of the largest twin registries in, in the world. It's a nationwide registry of uh, around 12,000 adult twin volunteers who've kindly agreed to, uh, to participate and give up their time to participate in, in various research studies. Um, the demographics of the cohort are that it happens to be mostly female. For some reason, females are more likely to gi give up their time uh, for, for, for these research studies we found, um, predominantly Caucasian, North European ancestry. And, uh, and uh, they all come to that's St. Thomas's Hospital there. Oh, you can't see the pointer here. Anyway, that's St. Thomas's Hospital there, uh, opposite the Houses of Parliament, uh, and that's that's where this uh, most of this work has been done. So, uh, a good uh, a little point of pride for St. Thomas's Hospital is it's the first place in the world that uh, an intraocular lens was put in an eye for uh, as, after cataract extraction by Sir Harold Ridley back in 1950. And there's quite an interesting story behind that, but it's not relevant to, to today. Um, so twin studies, uh, people have referred to them as uh, nature's experiment. You've got a, a, a cohort of people, uh, monozygotic twins who share their environment to some degree and all of their genes. And you've got dizygotic twins who probably share their environment roughly to the same degree as the monozygotic twins, but only half their genes. They're, they're as you know, genetically identical as, as siblings. Um, so one can look at any trait, and if you see a significantly higher intra-pair correlation in MZ twins versus DZ twins, it immediately tells you that there's a significant genetic contribution to the variance in that trait. Um, so you can just look at intra-pair correlations as, as a rough estimate, and then there's um, more advanced techniques of structural equation modeling to actually quantify heritability, how much of that particular trait is explained, uh, the variance in that trait is explained by genetic factors. Um, and we recently completed a, a study of 210 twin volunteers, uh, full ISEV ERGs, and that was published last month in, in ophthalmology, looking at the heritability of, of different ERG parameters. Since then, uh, we've been using the Retival to, to increase our, our sample size even further. So 200 is big for a, an ERG study, but for genetic epidemiology studies, it's microscopic. So with the Retival, we're, we're able to, to get a much bigger sample size. So these twins are kindly giving up their time to come for various research tests, and we just add on a, a Retival photopic uh, test. It takes a few minutes uh, in, in, in the room that they're already having the other tests. Um, so it's standard indoor lighting. We use the ISEV equivalent photopic stimuli that, that the device uh, does delivers, um, undilated, so it's adjusting the, um, uh, the stimulus intensity to get the right retinal illuminance uh, based on the pupil area. Uh, the, the order is it's the flash stimulus, then the photopic flicker stimulus, and uh, we do the right eye and then the left eye, and that's it. And uh, generally, I, I found early on that, that the flicker response seemed to be more ro robust than the flash response, and in order to minimize the time uh, that, that these individuals have to give up for, for, for these recordings, I told the research staff to basically concentrate more on the flicker time. So 
th there is a kind of bias towards flicker parameters here. Um, and if you had more time, then perhaps you'd, you'd get cleaner flash responses. Um, and, and it's rapid testing, no skin cleaning. So people coming in with makeup, whatever, just slap the electrode on and, and start. And you could say, again, that's going to uh, affect these responses. Uh, but we wanted things to move quickly. And I'd say that's not that different from the average ophthalmology clinic anyway. Um, so these are the kind of responses you get. Uh, uh, these, are, these are fairly good quality responses. Um, uh, flash, ERG, A wave, B wave and uh, 30 hertz approximately fit flicker response there. So uh, one thing we looked at was p specifically the heritability of the photopic flicker implicit time. I I'd kind of got an idea that that seemed to be the most reproducible, at least within the same session. The flicker implicit time seemed to be almost invariant within the same session. Um, and, and the other parameters we can look at and we haven't looked at yet because we've got a much bigger sample to, to play with, so I won't pr present any of that. Um, so 92 subjects. 29 monozygotic, 17 dizygotic twin pairs. Uh, the mean age of, uh, it is, it's, it's around the mean age of the cohort, 53 years. Um, and the mean implicit time was that. And the um, coefficients for intrapair correlation for MZ twins and DZ twins are shown there. And it was significant, it was double, uh, you had double the correlation in the MZ twins. So that immediately tells you that this trait is fairly heritable. The variance in that trait is, is pretty genetically determined. And when you calculate it explicitly, uh, you get a, a, a figure of 77% or 95% confidence interval between 54% and 87%. Uh, so that's quite interesting. It tells you your cone flicker implicit time is, is that heritable. But you can also to do something else because uh, the, the other component of that, so 77% is genetics, effectively 23% is the environment. Measurement error in a device counts as an, a unique environmental factor. So uh, as in if, if, if you have a device that's rubbish at measuring response, that will reduce your heritability because there's more environmental variation. So as well, when you get a high heritability, it also tells you that the, the, the measurement you're making is fairly accurate. It can't have too much error in it because it's giving you a, 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 a different result in monozygotic and dizygotic twin pairs. Um, very similar to Randy, I'd, I'd uh, uh, trained some research staff. They would trained other research staff. And then uh, a few weeks later, when I just wanted to check how, how people were doing it, the, the electrode was being put in all, all sorts of different positions from, uh, you know, compared to w what the recommended position is. Um, and uh, and it's, it's quite reasonable because it is a bit more comfortable if you have it lower down in the cheek. And people sometimes f find it a bit difficult to tolerate near the lid margin. So I thought, oh, well, that's fortuitous. Uh, we haven't got wasted data. We, that's an automatically a study we've done. What happens when you random the, <laughs> randomly put the, uh, the electrode wherever it's comfortable and or you put it in the correct position? And if, if we had about 48 in the first group, the comfortable position, often further down the cheek, and uh, 72 in the, in the kind of more correct position. And we found that, interestingly, uh, this is just flicker, 30 hertz flicker. The amplitudes varied significantly between the groups, but the implicit times were, were, were the same. And that's been shown for DTL position as well. So we're getting the same thing. We took about five normal subjects and then in, in, in the same subjects now, so these aren't different subjects, we looked at the flash and flicker responses, uh, varying the electrode position and n normalizing it to the other eye where, the, um, where the, the position was invariant. And again, we found the same thing. Amplitudes vary significantly, implicit times don't. Uh, so we, uh, we've now, uh, every slide I'll, <laughs> I'll give you has a bigger number because it's just an ongoing study that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, now over about 14 months, we thought let's, we've got, we've got a, a good normative database because if we ever want to use this in patients or in certain conditions, it's helpful to know what, what normal is. Uh, so by now, uh, this is being presented at Arvo uh, now, I think in a couple of days. Um, uh, 558 participants, again, this re reflects the, the demographics of the cohort um, uh, and uh, the age and ethnic uh, and gender distribution. So the, these are our sort of mean values uh, if, if you average both eyes. And uh, the, th those are our mean and median values. And we've got a fifth and 95th centile if you wanted to decide what's abnormal. And I have to say, still, this, this may be specific to our testing environment specific luminance in the room maybe and and a kind of rapid way of testing and maybe you could get get a, a slightly lower spread a smaller spread if, if you clean the skin and, and you did it more carefully with with more repeats um, that's averaging both eyes then we thought well actually you could look at right eyes and left eyes and uh, 
ideally we want to know what, what the repeatability of these measurements are. So you want to do subjects in two sessions, but that was a bit difficult to do in, in, with, with the, the logistics of our setup. But one can compare right eyes and left eyes, because in most people, right eyes and left eyes are highly correlated. In most healthy volunteers, your ERGs and the right eyes and left eyes are highly correlated. So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of surrogate repeatability type marker. So we plotted left eyes versus right eyes, and for flicker, uh, A wave, B wave, amplitudes on the left, implicit times on, on the right. And it kind of gone with, it, it went with what I was thinking, that th this is a beautiful correlation here. The flicker time really, you know, all of those subjects, they kind of line up. Left eyes and right eyes correlate, uh, amplitudes fairly well, but the, the flashes, not so much. Maybe the, the, the photopic flash, B wave, okay, but the other, there's, there's quite a bit of, uh, of scatter. Again, if you did it re several repeats, uh, it took, took time over it, you may, you may reduce some of that scatter. So that's quite interesting, and it, and it uh, sort of supported my notion that, that the flicker seems to be fairly robust. We then actually looked at the, the values, not just the correlation, but do right eyes and left eyes differ? For other reasons, I've been quite interested in different axial lengths between right eyes and left eyes and, and different susceptibility to different diseases. Um, in the ERGs, when we'd done simultaneous recording with, with the, you know, the, the color dome for the prior heritability study, I looked, the right and left eyes weren't different. So, so when you simultaneously stimulate both eyes, they're not different. So if we get a difference here, it's, it's something to do with the way we're recording. And it was a small difference, but it was a significant difference. Uh, even the A wave uh, amplitude, not the implicit time, B wave amplitude and uh, nearly the implicit, uh, implicit time, and the photopic flicker amplitude and implicit time were all significantly different if you compared all the right eyes against the, the left eyes. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you, know, you can decide whether you think that's clinically significant or not, perhaps not, but right eyes on average had a slightly higher amplitude and a slightly quicker response. Uh, no, slightly slower response, is that right? Right eye, or it actually changes for the, for the photopic flicker, interestingly, right minus left. So, so that's interesting. It's, it's, it's most likely, uh, you know, it, it, when you stimulate both eyes simultaneously, as I said, you don't get a difference. So it's not a real difference between right eyes and left eyes. You might think there shouldn't be, but I've, in, in other studies, you, there are actually real differences between the averages of right eyes and left eyes. Um, so what is it? It could be just the order. You, the, the way we test is you cover that eye and then you stimulate this eye and then you you know, then you do the same with the other eye. So is there some small adaptational effect with these large numbers? Now we're seeing uh, that effect. Could it be position? I mean, we're generally right-handed and you're trying to put the electrodes on and maybe you put it in a slightly different position consistently, ever so slightly different in the, uh, for the left eye than the right eye, don't know. So it's, it's worth looking at and probably what we need to do is uh, we were gonna just do left eyes first for a while. In fact, Quentin helpfully sent me a protocol where you can randomize which eye. I'm not doing it yet because I wanna do the same thing in all the subjects until I get a decent sample size for some good, good genetic associations, but then we really should randomize the eyes and, and then pin down what, what, what the origin of this effect is. Effects of age uh, we looked at as well. So if the age can do that to me, what can it do to my ERG? Um, so again, now it's the sample size got bigger, 679 subjects. Um, and uh, we got an age range from 18 to 84 years. M most of them around the sort of middle-aged uh, uh, range. If, if you were going to do this properly, you might want to look at equal numbers in, in, in each age category, but we just went with what we had. Uh, and we averaged, uh, obviously, twins are highly correlated with each other, so you shouldn't count a pair of twins twice because then you'll artificially just uh, strengthen whatever association you find. So we average each me uh, the, 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 both members of a twin pair when they're both there so that each twin pair is only counted once. And, and these were the Spearman correlation coefficients with, with age. Um, in, and, and they were significantly correlated with age and, and in the way you'd expect, and it's been shown before, uh, uh, implicit times get longer with age and amplitudes go down with age. Uh, interestingly, so th these were moderately strong uh, for 30 hertz flicker implicit time and, and flash B wave. So we, we then thought if you just do a linear fit, and, and there's no reason to believe it is linear, maybe it isn't linear, maybe it's flat over a gr big age range and then suddenly there's a lot of scatter in, in older age groups. But if you just uh, give it a linear fit, then your implicit time per decade uh, in increases by you know something like half a millisecond. Um, and comparing that with what we found with the prior study, it, you can't compare it directly, they're different subjects, it's a, it's a smaller sample size. It's not that different, although interestingly the, the difference in implicit, a 30 hertz flicker implicit time per decade was, was quite a bit higher in, in that study. 
Okay, so th those were the twin studies, some preliminary studies in patient cohorts. What, one thing that um, really attracted me to, to possibilities with the retival is we have, at least in London, quite a few patients, and certainly at Moorfields Eye Hospital, with, with uh, birdshot chorioretinopathy and, and at St. Thomas Hospital. And, and those of you who've managed these patients, it's quite a difficult disease to manage. You, is it, the symptoms are very vague. Should I go up on the immunosuppression? Should I go down? And, and there aren't that many hard parameters to, to go by. And there have been some studies suggesting that a hard parameter one can use is the 30 hertz flicker implicit time. It's perhaps the most sensitive uh, parameter for retinal dysfunction. So that could guide your treatment amongst all the other uh, things you're looking at. Most patients say outside more fields, they don't get that. If you've got to wait three months for an ERG and you want to guide your treatment now, it's not so easy. Whereas if you have something you can do quickly in clinic, potentially uh, that, that could be helpful. So, uh, so, so far, we, don't, we only recorded from uh, 11 patients. We thought we'd do them on a conventional, because a lot of people are skeptical, in, in, including me, you know, is it as good? It pro probably isn't as precise as a conventional ERG setups and you're going to guide immunosuppressive treatment based on this. You probably should have some good validation data first before you start trying to uh, base your de decisions on the retival. So our preliminary, uh, preliminary results uh, are shown here. First, we found that the mean implicit time is different with the retival and, a, and a, say, uh, the diagnosis color dome. And, and I guess that, uh, you know, d different bits of equipment uh, have different normative ranges. It's 28 hertz versus 30, maybe. That's the reason. I just, it'll be interesting to look at. So it just reinforces you need normative, uh, a normative range for that device. And uh, that's just an example, so a normal subject and a patient with a, a delayed and, and uh, reduced flicker uh, uh, waveform. And, uh, and, and then when you plot uh, conventional, say, ERG testing, uh, the, the retival against that, you get a good correlation. So although it, it's, it's got a different normative range, they're significantly shorter, they correlate fairly well on the two devices. And, and we want, you know, we're, we're going to uh, increase the sample size and do proper bland altman comparisons. But that's promising for me that we get that kind of correlation in, uh, in, in such a small sample. Uh, we, we just out of interest thought we, we could see what else might be associated with the flicker ERG in these patients. Uh, we know that uh, uh, with birdshot, with chronic disease, you get tissue loss in the retina. The retina thins. In, in acute, uh, acutely, when you have inflammation, you may have some cystoid macular edema, but over time, the retina may thin. Uh, most of these patients had OCTs, so we thought we'd just look at what the correlation was with macular volume. So here, again, patient with a normalish looking retinal thickness and a patient with a thin retina. Um, interesting, we found that the uh, Flicker ERG amplitude correlated fairly strongly with macular volume. And, you know, it's a full field measurement. It's not just affected by the macula at all. But I guess you'd, you might think that if you've got less tissue there, then you'll get a, a smaller response. The implicit time didn't correlate so strongly. It correlated significantly, but not so strongly. But actually, this is in keeping with what we think is the case anyway. We think there's a, there's a time when you haven't got tissue loss, but the retina's dysfunctional, where treatment could rescue the retina. So actually, that, that should be the case, it, that the implicit time won't correlate so strongly with macular volume. So it kind of, it's consistent with that notion. Uh, so, uh, and finally, a bit like what we uh, ha had before, uh, I don't need to now introduce you to the fact that the ERG has been shown to be abnormal in various neurological and neuropsychiatric conditions, some of which I've become to be uh, become interested in, um, and it could provide us insights into neuronal pathways in disease. So this is a very interesting uh, review from a, a while ago, looking at the brain through the retina. The retina is an accessible bit of the brain at the back of the eye that we can directly re record from. So can we get some insights into what's going on in 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 some of these conditions? Uh, and similarly, this these, this is data from. Uh, collaborators at the Institute of Psychiatry in, in King's College London, uh, which is one of the largest patient cohorts in, in, in Europe. And they've just begun to start looking at uh, uh, retinal response. So this is the photopic negative response that we sh sh uh, saw before, uh, looking at individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and, and that's the sample size so far. Far the rest are, uh, are controls. Um, and, and this is just some of their very early results um, you may not be able to see it very clearly, but we've got A wave and B wave amplitudes and implicit times. And you see a bit, bit more scatter for some of the parameters in the patients who are in blue. But um, quite interestingly, the B wave implicit time is significantly delayed in, in, in the patients compared uh, to the age, ma age matched control. So it, it, it bears further exploration. 
Uh, so in conclusion, just a, a, f a few concluding remarks or things that I've learned. Um, I've also found that the retival testing is, is fairly well tolerated. People are more comfortable with, with skin electrodes than, than an electrode put in their eye, even though I think the detail's very, very comfortable and, and uh, gives you a fairly reliable response. Also well tolerate, tolerated by the research staff who are doing the tests. You try to sort of educate someone to, can you put this electrode in someone's eye and they run a mile, but we just put, put, a, put a sticker on a bit like an ECG sticker and, and, uh, and they're quite happy to do it. Normative data are very important as, as we already know. Um, I think the 30 hertz flick implicit times seem to be quite robust. They've got good intra-session reliability at any rate and, and good right-left correlation. Um, the electrode position, we have to take care with it, dramatically affects the amplitudes. But interestingly, not so much the implicit time. So if, you ha if you're doing a study where a patient can't tolerate it, you know, where it's meant to be, well, maybe you could put it down a bit and, and then assume the amplitude's down, but the implicit time's okay, perhaps. Uh, these right-left differences, it's something to do with the order uh, that invites further exploration. I think it's useful as a research tool, especially to tack on to other research studies where it's not feasible to have a, 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 a full-field ERG system in a separate room. Um, and, and I think it, it will have potential utility in, in clinic, either as a screening tool or some adjunct, adjunct to, to inform our management decisions. Thanks very much. difference between the um, stimulus frequency for flicker between this instrument and the more traditional instruments about 30 hertz versus 28.3 um, why didn't you do it the usual way and can it be done the usual way if you want to right so uh, Omar I think I'll answer that one yeah that's that's like. to you presumably the, um, why so didn't you? I, I think the diagnosis machine uses about 32 Hertz I think our UTAS uses 30.3 hertz. No one uses exactly 30 hertz because um, the second harmonic of 30 hertz is 60 hertz, which is the power line frequency in uh, North America and half of Japan. Um, so you don't want to use exactly that. Um, so the ISF standard just says around 30 hertz. Yeah. The, uh, the reason why we went a little bit slower was because the, um, the period therefore is a little longer and we were worried that in some diseases where you could have an extremely long delay, you could actually get confused on should it be a short sample or a long sample because the, um, in a flicker response you don't actually know what, the, you know what the phase is and you have to interpret it as a delay. So um, is it the first peak that happens or is it the second peak that happens? So you get a little more margin of error there. But perhaps your, your implicit time difference is because of that small change in, um, in frequency from 28.3 hertz to the 32 hertz I think the diagnosis uses. Oh, and uh, could the user adjust it? Yes, the, the, the user could adjust it. Um, the 28 hertz was kind of optimized on the red eval, so the camera is flashing, is taking photographs at the exact same frequency, so the, the camera is synchronized to the flash, to the flickering rate, so you don't get you know, a bright flash sometimes when the camera is trying to take a picture at the same time that the stimulus is. So you can use any frequency you like, but there's a 28.3 hertz is special. So, yeah, and, and we're in the process of, of, at least with the color dome, where you can vary the frequency a bit, just testing that out, just see what happens when you go from 28 to 30 to, to 32, um, and, and see what happens to the implicit time, I guess, and that would answer that. Are there any other questions for? What, what electrode are you using with the color dome? Same one? Uh, with, with the color dome, D, DTL, the diagnosis DTL, yeah. Any other uh, Questions for Omar? Yeah, I'm interested in the uh, amplitude, amplitude differences based on position. Just how much latitude do you have before things really dramatically change? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's a, it's a difficult question. How much can you tolerate in, in, in terms of your change in amplitude? It, it seems to be continuously variable. It's something you get with the DTL as well. So we find that if you have it low down in the fornix, the amplitudes are, are lower than if you have the DTL positioned pretty much at the lid margin. And, uh, and, and people have their different favorite position. But as long as you use the same position, then, 
then that's, that's what's important. So I prefer it down in the fornix because it tends to be more stable and not ride around so much. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's a good question. I guess as long as you have it in the same position, if you're doing something longitudinal and, and in the same position, preferably in each patient, there'll, there'll be differences in facial structure that probably, probably have an impact, I, I don't know. I, I did a study on me, and I think, I, if I remember right, I got about 4% per millimeter. So, oh, brilliant. you know, so the specification is like two millimeters below the lower eyelashes. So, you know, if you're you know, plus or minus two from there, you only got, you know, plus or minus eight. But the issue is when you go down, you know, a centimeter and now, you know, 4% times 10 is 40%. Now you got a, a real big amplitude change. Any other uh, questions for, for Omar? Thanks, Omar. Thanks very much.